By request of the meeting organizer, this meeting is being recorded. These learning exchange webinars, um, a discussion on youth the age 13 to 24 and their health outcomes. I'm Michael Hager, I'm the manager of technical assistance and dissemination at the National Quality Center, and you know, thank you everyone for uh, joining us. Before we start, one of the things that we like to do is just to get to know who's on the call with us. Um, so in the chat room, if you could just enter a little bit of uh, information on yourself, maybe your name, your organization, or where you get your care if you're a consumer, um, and city and state in the chat room. That way we can uh, interact with each other throughout the call and maybe make some new connections and friends that we may not have had before. So let's see, Michael Hager, NQC, NYNY, and Disparities Lead. And thanks so much to everyone else who is uh, signing in. All righty. So um, just a couple of ground rules. Um, because it's an important discussion, I've left everyone's line unmuted. But um, I will go ahead and mute the lines if there are um, um, unwanted distraction or disturbances. Really what we want to try to do is encourage as much discussion as possible without um, interference. And we are recording the webinar for folks who want to refer back to it later or for sharing or for folks who um, wanted to attend today but weren't able to make it. <clears throat> If you're interested in um, muting yourself at any time in the discussion, um, you can find your name in the participants list and there'll be an orange um, microphone to the right of your name. Uh, you can click that to unmute yourself and you'll see that there's a white one there and you can click that to remute yourself. Um, we ask that you um, actively participate by writing your questions and comments in the chat room. But of course, since the lines are, are unmuted, you can also kind of shout out your question um, you know, or engage in discussion that way as well. <laughs> I don't know if Clemens has joined. I don't see him here. Clemens is our director of the National Quality Center, and normally this is where he would provide words of welcome to you all. So I'll go ahead and take that honor for him. Um, we're really excited to bring you the Learning Exchange. Um, it's been uh, quite the journey since October when we kicked this off, and we've uh, engaged with uh, an enormous number of people. I believe that so far our analysis shows that over 750 unique individuals have participated in our events, and they come from almost every state and territory, um, represent every part funding, and um, I hope that there's been a lot of learning among those 750 folks who have joined. Uh, without you, we wouldn't be able to put on a program like this because, as you know, National Quality Center knows a lot of people, and we know quite a bit, but you are the experts. And so by bringing you to the call to share your experience and expertise, it's really what makes the difference to everyone else. So thank you so much for being here, for listening in, and for sharing your own experience as it relates to youth health outcomes. You're welcome. So um, just a little bit on the Learning Exchange for those who are joining us for the first time or those who are watching or recording for the first time. Um, as I mentioned before, we kicked off in October or running through June. We selected four populations that were listed in um, national priorities uh, from the previous administration. Um, but really we are focused on ending disparities for any group um, that you serve that is experiencing disparities in health outcomes. And we want to create an informal discussion um, or a formal um, sharing mechanism for folks in the field to be able to support each other and learn from each other in uh, ending disparities among their patients. Uh, this program is just one of the many programs offered by NQC. Um, for more information, you can visit our N uh, website, uh, www.nationalqualitycenter.org. You can see that in the lower right of your screen here. Um, we have very uh, informal, kind of passive ways of getting technical assistance on quality management um, by going to our website and, and watching videos in our Quality Academy or reading publications. But you can also request, um, you can also request uh, direct technical assistance from our experts. Um, and there are other group learning activities as well, such as customized training and occasional collaboratives that we um, create in collaboration with our federal partners. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now I just want to, um, you know, describe a little bit what we're discussing today. Um, we're in the middle of our welcome and introductions, um, and soon we're going to turn it over to um, hear a little bit um, from some of our spokespeople, um, Devin and Noel, um, to provide um, some experience, uh, you know, and young voices in healthcare. 
Uh, we're also going to hear some um, Part D program experiences from um, Barb um, in Wisconsin and from Anna in Florida so that we can get a sense of what types of challenges and what types of solutions are in place in very different parts of our country. We'll see that there are some um, ways in which we have great similarities and we'll also see some of those differences that I had mentioned. Um, after that, we'll have an opportunity to share um, resources with each other. And um, then we'll wrap up by having a Q&A session. So um, our learning objectives for today. Um, and our learning objectives will be assessed in our evaluation that I'll email out to everyone with the recording following the webinar. Um, name two solutions to implement that will assist adolescents uh, to transition into adult care. Describe considerations um, important to communicating effectively with youth, including specific technology solutions. And explain the concept of system co-design and why it's important to serving youth. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce my uh, friend and colleague, Jane Caruso. Jane is an NQC coach, and she's been with us now for, I don't know, I think about um, seven years, if that's right, Jane. That's correct. And uh, before uh, working with us and even um, overlapping a little bit, um, she was um, leading the uh, New Jersey Part D program. Um, she was leading the New Jersey um, Part D program um, and, sorry about that, I just wanted to mute, and um, has uh, been involved in Ryan White Services for many, many years. Um, she is a nurse by training and um, is a delight to work with and is uh, brilliant when it comes to quality improvement. And so I'm just um, pleased as punch to introduce Jane um, to have her facilitate uh, the rest of today's call. Jane? Hey, thanks, Michael. One correction, I'm not a nurse, never was a nurse, so don't oh. give me credit for something I'm not. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, um, I was actually, my, my training is actually clinical microbiology but and then um, epidemiology, but um, nursing is not my, my field. I'll leave that to Ellen. She's on the call today, too, from New Jersey. Um, okay, so um, let's get started. Um, we are going to be hearing from two young consumers and to Ryan White program staff regarding their experiences either receiving HIV services or in serving the youth that live with HIV. And as Michael said, we have a mix. We have folks from the north and the south. We have folks from the city and from rural areas. And I think this mix will help us uh, best explore our youth health outcomes. Let's get started. I'd like to introduce to you Devin Quinn. Um, he's a peer navigator for Nationwide Children's Hospital. He's a great public speaker, a devoted advocate for a bunch of HIV. Um, Devin's been living with HIV since 2012, and he works a lot in his community to raise awareness and understanding for those that are affected by HIV. He's also, and this is really cool, he's also a board member of a nonprofit called Youth Across Borders, and that's an organization that specializes in fostering connections in young people. And they do this through a, a service trip to this orphanage in rural Honduras. So I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to Devin. I think you'll find him fascinating. So Devin, let's uh, hear a little bit more about your experience. Well, hello again, my name is Devin Quinn. Thank you for having me on the call today. I'm really happy to be here. I've been uh, living with HIV since 2012 and I have been working in the field of HIV since about, oh, a day after that. Um, I kind of jumped into things pretty quickly. Um, I currently work as a peer navigator uh, with the Friday in Nationwide that. Children's Hospital Program yeah. um, uh, Faces, and I work as a peer navigator, and my job is basically just kind of escort people through care and kind of guide them through that process and help them with any sort of difficulties they're experiencing. Um, I wanted to become a part of this program because I think, well, there are a lot of reasons. Um, I recognize that as a young person of color living with HIV, it's imperative that the needs of the community are reflected in the everyday agendas of the service providers. And by having a seat at the no. table as a stakeholder, I can hold accountable those who make decisions, which might impact others who might be in a similar situation as myself, but might not have the same advantages or privilege that I have, and I have to make sure that they feel represented. Um, also, there are not only current but growing disparities in how I believe we handle HIV care. Um, it's represented in how differently HIV infection rates can range from area to area across the country. 
I don't think the Mendelssohn model by any means is broken or wrong, but I do think there are lessons to be learned from areas that are clearly having greater success with their HIV infection rates. And I feel it's my job to kind of figure out what those lessons are and how I can spread those around the country, not only amongst my own community. Okay, that's great, Devin. Can you um, share anything that you've learned through this? Is there anything that you learned that you might share with providers that would help them better understand or relate to today's youth? Well, I think the I'm interesting definitely. thing about that would be, um, it's funny because a lot of the things I hear so much are that youth don't care or they're not engaged or they're not at the table when it comes to HIV mm -hmm. care. But from my perspective, and I'm always willing to admit I'm wrong, but from my perspective, it seems as though that young people are really leading the charge in making HIV very visible and very uh, aware and less stigmatizing. And so there seems to be some sort of a gap in between some sort of providers and the clients in which they serve, and they do not view that those clients have the same kind of uh, views of importance on HIV, and really I think it's a matter of messaging, it's a matter of how we treat our clients, if we treat them with respect, if we recognize um, their hierarchy of needs, if we recognize where they're coming from and how they respond to certain things, because some people just don't consider HIV to be the serious thing it once was, even though it's still, we can still consider it very serious, and so it's just kind of bridging that messaging and making sure we tailor each message to each community so people feel really involved in their care and so they feel that they have a stake at the table. Because a lot of people just don't feel the decisions are made with them because they don't feel there are advantages to them to being on that table. Very interesting. Thanks. That's really, really helpful. Um, interesting to hear. Um, if there's any questions from the audience, um, I, and Devin, you're going to hang out for a while, right? I am. Okay, good. Um, if there's any questions from the audience, make sure you post them to everyone so that we could all see. Or is there anyone right now that, that has something they'd like to share with Devin or ask of Devin before I move on? No. Not for me. And just a quick note that um, if um, you're speaking but don't hear your voice coming through the line, I may have muted you. Um, and you'll see the little orange um, uh, icon to the right of your name. Okay, so uh, let's move on to Noel. Uh, Noel is originally from Argentina. He's been a consumer for 11 years, currently living in Charlottesville, Virginia, and he is now the peer services coordinator for the University of Virginia's Ryan White Clinic. Um, he's also an experienced peer educator, also a great public speaker, and he's worked to develop new approaches to both engaging people in care and preventing HIV. Um, his first professional role here in the United States was to help design a peer coach program, and he's also worked to evaluate uh, that program and those results and outcomes. Um, he's effectively worked to bridge gaps between stakeholder groups in order to, to develop local and regional strategies for helping consumers with HIV, and I think that's where it all begins. That's really critical, those local and regional strategies. So there's a lot much more to tell, but I'll let Noelle um, share all that with you. So Noelle, talk to us a bit about your experience as a youth with HIV, what you learned from that, how you encourage providers to interact with their younger patients, all that good stuff. So take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Jane. Uh, so, um, my name is Noel Smith. Uh, I, uh, like Jane uh, said, I've been living with HIV for uh, more than uh, 12 years at this point, uh, and I, 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 I love to do uh, the work that I do with HIV. I, I have been like recently getting more involved uh, as I took over uh, my role here at UVA. Uh, into the peer program and the development of new strategies to um, to uh, really engage uh, youth and also any other patients living with HIV. Um, so um, I I wanted to really uh, emphasize like why I wanted to uh, really join this uh, uh, in the Spiritus campaign. 
Um, I really wanted to, to join the campaign to be able to first share my story, uh, empowering and motivating other young people living with HIV to step up and get involved. Really, um, oftentimes uh, you don't really feel um, connected or identified uh, with other people living with HIV. And through my life experience, I found that putting myself in the spotlight um, helps uh, other people to realize that it's possible uh, to live uh, happy and healthy with HIV. Uh, also to be successful and pass the knowledge to others in the same way. Uh, and really aiming for a happy and stigma-free uh, future for everyone uh, in, in the HIV community. <laughs> sorry for that. Michael, can you uh, help us mute some stuff? I'm sorry? I'm talking to Michael. Michael, can you help us mute some lines or something? Yes, um, I think that I think that if if that happens again, I'll mute all lines and then I'll unmute. Um, I, I don't know if that was background noise. On I was uh, looking up and down the line to see um, who to mute, but <laughs> if it happens again, then I'll mute all lines. I just I find the value in keeping the lines open, if that's okay. Okay, great, great, great. Okay, so um, any questions for Noel? Anything from the audience? If anybody wants to speak now, Michael, they would just unmute themselves, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. So um, if you have a question, you can uh, get it up or um, unmute your line. But in the meantime, um, I'd like to actually ask the both of you, you young'uns. Um, <laughs> I was a, a Part D program director, and we really wanted to get our young people out into their communities to share and to educate it. But for me, it, it really just didn't happen, or at least not effectively. We have some older women who are willing to do these things, go to the health fairs, speak at the churches, go to the colleges and stuff like that, but not really a teenager or, or a young adult. And I do believe that our, our providers had very trustful and respectful relationships with our youth, but we never got them to step out into the community. So what I want to know is, how did you both become so empowered? Is it something inside of you? Is it just who you are? Or were there external forces that helped you with that empowerment? Uh, I think for me, personally, it was a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. Um, I, was, I felt that this was something that kind of grabbed hold of me and that I had the ability to work with it and you know, speak honestly about it. Um, but also, I felt really encouraged by the people I was directly working with in my care team at the time. Um, they thought that I was capable to kind of carry that mantle, as it were, and they, they kind of fostered that relationship. And I think that's why I, I now work in peer support, is because I believe in fostering those relationships, building people up. And it, it takes a lot of work, and it, it's not always successful, because a lot of people just don't want that spotlight, and I can appreciate that. But I talk to a lot of people all the time who say they want to get involved in the community, they just don't know how, they don't know the proper avenues. It can be very intimidating um, to do something like that with people. And so if you walk with someone individually and have a peer journey, then you can learn really what they want to do, how they want to do it, and they can ask questions and feel supported. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, so Jane, like this is Judy. Go ahead. I have a question for Noel. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, I was just wondering, since you've had so much experience developing strategies and working in this role, um, do you have any resources that you would be willing or able to share? I have a lot of um, grantees, recipients, if you will, that want to start programs and they they know that there's, for instance, a certification course in New York, but it doesn't work for Florida or Georgia, but um, they're looking for tools or some guidance, and I was just wondering if you had anything developed that you would be willing to share. So um, personally, with the peer program that we started here at UVA, um, we really have been, before we uh, started the peer program, we started um, looking at different other peer programs uh, around the, our region because uh, we know that we have to understand the, the population that we're serving and really to try to, um, to create some approaches that really will relate to the, our uh, clientele here. So um, we uh, we've done a lot of like assessments uh, prior to uh, release our pilot project, and together with um, with a group that I I, I always uh, say openly uh, a consultant group um, uh, located in D.C. 
uh, Ribbon Consulting Group that has been really uh, helpful for us to develop um, um, the curricula for the trainings uh, for the peer coaches, how uh, we get, uh, how did we really create the recruitment for not just for the peer coaches, also for the clients that we uh, we sell the idea of peer coaching and how peer coaching really will help them uh, uh, in their lives. Um, so um, we have uh, we have a, a program that has been running for uh, the last three years at our organization so far, and um, I, I can share uh, I can share some material uh, with you um, uh, later on. Uh, that has been really helpful uh, from the um, from really from the topics that we have been training uh, all the and the peer the consumers that became peer coaches and really all the little details that we have been going through down the the path as a uh, professional development investment for them uh, so they they are now uh, not just peer coaches they're also public speakers they're also um, uh, peer navigators in our clinic they're also uh, uh, in getting involved with all the different programs uh, in our clinic uh, to really bring people together living with HIV and empower people to really like go to the client advice room board meetings to really uh, get out of uh, their um, their uh, houses and really like come to the clinic, really want to come to the clinic to be in care, to be healthy, to connect with other people, uh, and uh, tell their story. That is really uh, important for a lot of people living with HIV to tell their story. Um, so uh, for sure, I can I can share those resources. The uh, Ribbon Consulting Group uh, they have been doing an amazing job together with us, and uh, our experience uh, through. Uh, I do have a presentation or, and that I can send you, um, and I can share with you, Michael, that it has been all um, from. Uh, prior to the pilot project of the peer program, the pilot stage, and uh, our first and second year of the uh, of the peer program, and some of our outcomes, they have been uh, really uh, remarkable. The I, just uh, to put it out, uh, in our first uh, year of the peer program, uh, we with all the patients that we have enrolled uh, as a uh, as the uh, people receiving peer coaching, we have overall 100% viral suppression, 100% retention in care, and um, um, medication adherence as well, as well. So, and that is different than the other percentages uh, for the rest of the patient in our clinic. So, uh, for sure, the the outcomes in my presentation uh, will speak for themselves. And uh, and if you have more questions, please don't uh, don't hesitate to really uh, reach out to us, uh, and we will be happy to share um, more uh, of our material. Thank that you so much great. for that offer. Um, we're really excited to post that on the website under external resources, and um, I'm really happy that you offered to share that. Thanks, Noel. Yeah, you're welcome. And Noel, talk about uh, any more questions. There is one for you in the tra chat room. We did hear from Deb, and we'd like to hear um, someone from California would also like to hear from you about how you became motivated and empowered to step up and serve in the in the level that you are. So I think it's a it's a little bit connected to also my personality. That I'm like very very open, uh, uh, and I like to talk a lot. <laughs> So um, I think uh, since I've been diagnosed, I really um, I, I face a lot of like bad moments, like any other person <laughs> living with HIV or being recently diagnosed. And um, I think uh, and all those um, all those problems that I have and I have been facing through my life really motivated me even more and more to uh, to really answer the question like why people living with HIV really have to face all these difficulties, why you have to feel so ashamed of living with HIV. So um, through my, uh, through my uh, really uh, motivation of like really like knowing more and really wanting to be more involved when I first came to the United States in particular, because it, it really, I, I, uh, I think um, to be more involved when I moved to the States. Um, 
I, I started here at the clinic that I received care and where I work currently. Uh, and one of our um, uh, one of our doctors really uh, approached me and said, "Hey, I think that uh, that uh, we have this idea of, of your program that will be, and I think that you will be really good for it." Uh, and so from the from the from that uh, physician really uh, interest in me to really get involved, uh, they really empower me to really try to uh, to do it different to to have something different in our clinic in our uh, in our region. So um, I got involved um, because of her at that point. But then when I when I started volunteering at the beginning of the program, I really seen the faces of the of the people receiving the services and how the service really was changing their lives. Um, it was really helping them to get out of their shell, to really be more confident, to take their meds. And to really want to speak with their uh, with their provider, and seeing that transformation from uh, from being a uh, very confident person to be afraid to be to be coming to the clinic to show up to events to really uh, tell me that they really uh, went for a walk with their with their daughter they, that they were talking about uh, HIV with their family it really uh, it really uh, connected me even more to the a reality that the people that we were serving was, and uh, that gave me more energy to really like continue and create new a new uh, strategies to connect with everyone because it was not just uh, only youth and that it was the the population that we were serving at the beginning. Uh, everyone needed to have uh, a, a peer coach, and that uh, that was my 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 belief at the time. Uh, and and so far it has been really it has been really good and uh, from my coordinator position now I see uh, the two faces still like, uh, the peer coach really learning uh, and being empowered of seeing the the transformation with the client is going through uh, and feeling that they're making a difference in their lives. Uh, and wanted to replicate that uh, that effort with other persons, uh, and the clients really wanted to get more involved because they want to give back to their community what they receive. So um, I think my motivation uh, is, is that to see that it, it really and the work that that we do makes a difference to the clients that they receive the service. Noelle, thank you for that, and Devin, thank you also. It's really helpful for us to understand that, so I, I appreciate your sharing. That's great. Um, if the two of you would, would stay on and feel free to chime in, we're going to talk to a different perspective now. We're going to go to two, um, two of our providers, so hang out um, and feel free to chime in whenever you want to. Um, I'd like now to introduce um, our friend and colleague, Barb Keen. She has a master's degree in science in nursing from Marquette University in Milwaukee. She began her work at Children's Hospital in Wisconsin caring for those perinatally infected babies. And that was before the availability of antiretroviral therapy. And things were very, very different back then in the early 90s. And if you're around as long as Barb and I have been, you'll remember the impact of ACTG 076 trials to reduce uh, vertical transmission and, and the huge impact that has made. So in 94, she then expanded her program to a statewide project caring for the wiki population, and they began to educate providers about the need to test pregnant women and provide them with proper care and treatment. So today, uh, Barb uh, coordinates an intensive nurse case management program that spans across healthcare systems to serve these vulnerable folks, the women, youth, infant, children, and the challenges that they face, whether it be staying in care or taking their meds or achieving suppression. So Barb, we're all interested. Why don't you start to tell us about your model at Children's Hospital and some of your outcomes? Um, thank you and good afternoon. I am excited to share a little bit about our program and some of our outcomes. And then there were two things that I was going to focus a little bit of time on, and that's transition um, from adolescent care to adult care and the use of technology. And I will tell you, I'm old, um, and anything I've learned about technology has been from my patients. That's where it's all come from. Um, so as, as Jane said, we are a nurse case management program. Uh, we serve children living with HIV across the state 
and we link um, children with their primary care providers in their local communities or youth with their, their uh, primary care providers in their local community. And then we work with them at a distance um, from the two children's hospitals in the state. The kids come to our clinic a couple times a year, but in reality, the nurses do a huge amount of work outside of clinic. Um, the best way to describe that, I think, is that our, we put on 45,000 miles last year in driving. Um, our program was developed because of managed care and they made us develop it this way, but it really works out best so that kids and families can stay in their local community and don't have to travel 10 miles or 10 hours to come to Milwaukee or Madison to get their care. So we've been around a long time um, doing that. The kids get their medical care um, at the children's hospitals um, up to the age of 18 and we transition them to adult care after that. Um, but we also serve not just those kids, but the nurse case managers serve um, adolescents up through the age of 25 um, that are cared for by a adult care provider. And these kids are having trouble staying in care, whether they're having trouble remembering their medicines, going to their appointments, or whatever it is, um, they're having troubles and the adult providers reach out to us and ask if our nurses can work with those patients. Um, so there's two groups that we work with, so we've had the advantage of seeing both sides, the adult side as well as the pediatric side. Um, last year we served about 105 kids or youth, uh, children and youth. About 80% were, were um, children and youth that were African American, 13% Hispanic, and 3% Asian. So uh, a heavy population of children and youth of color. 61% were male, 1% transgender, and 38% female and kind of a split between perinatally and behaviorally acquired uh, virus, 49% perinatal, perinatally acquired. Only about 50% of the kids live in Milwaukee, so we do serve um, patients from all over the state. Um, and and our, I love what I do. I, I, every day I'm grateful to be able to, to come in and, and serve the clients that we work with. Um, we've had some pretty good outcomes, I think. Um, I do have those here. Um, if we look at um, retention and care, we are certainly not as good as the program that Noel described before. We have ways to go on that. Um, but uh, if you look at our retention rate in 2016, it was 78.6% with viral load suppression at 86.4%. Um, so we certainly are benchmarking well with Ryan White programs. We have a ways to go and we have a quality group looking at all those issues trying to help Figure out what um, we can I do. see uh, oh. Barbara Kuhn, just that yes. one, yeah. All right, sorry about that. Uh, I think what I'm gonna do is go ahead and mute all in because we're still getting a little bit of disruption and um, when it's time for question and answer, we'll cover how to unmute those lines. Yes. Okay, uh, so our trans the transition planning that we do actually starts when the kids are very young. And I know that sounds weird, but we do. When, uh, you can look at transition as technically the, the change from a pediatric to an adult provider. That's one way of looking at it. But the broader way to look at it is preparing a child and a family to, to no, move no. who is responsible for the child's care from the parent to the child. And that can't just happen at an instant. That has to be something that happens from little on. Um, so that's how we view transition. And so if you look at a little child that you're working with and the work that you're doing, if you view it not just as a task, but as a way to teach somebody how to do something, it changes how you approach things. So for instance, we've had, we, our youngest child is now about four. And when that child was um, little, we were changing the med doses all the time. And the child lived a couple hours away from Milwaukee. The nurse would go to the home and make the med changes but didn't use that as just a task. She would actually use that as a time to teach and help not just the parent, but the child learn what she was doing so that as they learn more and more, they're able to take on more responsibility for themselves. So that's why I really view transition planning starting from day one when we meet a patient. Um, we learned this the hard way. Uh, the good, bad, and the ugly is we failed the first time we trans transitioned somebody early on into early 2003, I think it was. We transitioned and the child did not do well because we didn't do a good work in pre preparing for that. So what we learned from that was we got a community group together of both adult and pediatric providers and we went to New York to a national workshop 
and identified an approach to community transition. So we looked at it as a community issue, not as our issue or the adult issue, but as something we needed to develop together. And because we did it together, everybody was really energized about it. We came back to uh, Milwaukee, and over the course of about a year, we had some work groups going on, and we had uh, we developed a, what I think is a pretty good way of staging transition um, between pediatric and adult providers. Typically, we will transition primary care first, and the nurse goes with the patient to their new primary care provider, helps in that process. And then if the child or youth has um, other subspecialties, some of the kids have had some fairly extensive other issues. Um, some have had some cancers and other diseases. Um, then we transition the subspecialty care, and finally we transition the um, HIV care. But our nurses cross over, and our nurses go with patients to their new care providers for as long as they need us to be there. Um, I have like a 22-year-old young woman right now who I've known since she was, you know, first diagnosed as a, a little tiny baby, and watched her grow up and transition with her to the adult care provider to help provide some continuity along the way. She has some abandonment issues, and when she, when there's a change in her life, it, it causes her to stop taking care of herself, and so. We're there as long as she needs us um, to help her stay in care. So I bring her medicines to her every couple of weeks. I do a lot of work with her trying to help her get to appointments. And it's all done on text messaging. So we tie transition of care to text messaging very quickly because that's how she likes to communicate. That was hard for me to learn, I'll be honest, how to do all of that via text messaging, but she's been a great teacher for me. And I am constantly impressed at how much feelings can be shared over text messaging that I didn't know could happen. And uh, uh, for whatever reason, many of the kids feel more comfortable sharing their feelings over text messaging, um, and we are able to make that work. So for her, I continue to work with her and her adult care providers, and I will until she no longer needs me. Part of what is the issue with that young woman is she's in college, so she's got college, she's working, and. Uh, Providers' office hours are from 9 until 5. And to try to help kids learn the negotiating skills between school and work and medical care is really hard, really hard. And she wants to do well in school and doesn't want to skip school. So a lot of it is, is helping identify that she identifies a problem, and I don't do it, fix it for her, but we text and try to problem solve to find a way that will work for her so she doesn't feel bad about having to miss school, yet still get her medical care. And that all takes a lot of time. Barb, I'm going to interrupt for one second because there's a question in the in the chat room. Do you have a particular age at which you transition, or that you aim or, or, or a goal for a transition age, or is that really dependent on each patient? Yeah, that's a good question. The goal is, uh, the transition plan goes on the chart at age 12. Our goal is usually around age 18. Some of the kids, though, if they go to college outstate, we will follow them through college in our program if, they're, if, if that will work for them because we, we do care at a distance really well. That's one thing, because Wisconsin is such a, a rural state, we know how to do care at a distance. So we will follow them through college and then transition to adult provider after that. If they're going to college locally, though, like this young girl, we transitioned her at age 18. But it's a, the nurse goes with the patient, so they say goodbye to the hospital, which is which is challenging. They say goodbye to the physician, Dr. Havens, which is very challenging. Um, but they get to keep the nurse through that challenging part. Does that answer yeah, the question? I, okay. I think that was great. Right, the first. There, there have been other kids that we've transitioned um, that have been, they did really well. They didn't have um, some of the same challenges and um, they had more skills or different skills and they were able to transition to adult care and they didn't need us after the first visit. It just really depends on the patient and um, that patient and family needs. We have a, a, a transition packet that we keep that we send to the new provider and that we write a letter that 
summarizes all of the medical care. Each problem we go through, um, we provide, we have a database that we provide the graph page with their meds and their CD4s and viral loads. And some of these kids, not so much anymore, but a few years ago, some of these kids grew up that we really screwed um, because they were born in, before 1996 and they were on sequential monotherapy. And so they had, they have very resistant virus by the time they're 18 and when we send them to an adult provider, that's, that's a lot of conversation with them about how they got to where they are. And um, now there are obviously better options open um, for medications, but that's a significant um, part of the discussion. We sent all of the old resistance testing hard copies of all of that. Any of the special labs, we send hard copies um, with them so that the new provider has all of that. EPIC, uh, many people have EPIC, and many things can be seen in EPIC, but there's something to be said about getting the hard copy of some things to be sent along. Um, Absolutely. So I don't know if there's questions about transition. I think that the challenges, uh, that was another question to answer, the challenges, uh, the challenges that, that many of the youth that, that we care for face are really related to um, trying to manage jobs, school, life, and housing. Those things are so important, and unless we as providers acknowledge that and try to work around that, we can lose kids because of that. So if there was some magic bullet to be able to manage all of those things, I, I would love that. I will work, we will work really hard to try to help kids stay in school and keep their job and not let medical care um, interrupt that, because that's so important to kids. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that. It's funny because that was on my list of questions. Um, talking about transitioning is much more than teaching the child how to fill a prescription or make an appointment. Um, yes. tra it, it's a transition into adulthood, which means school, which means a job, which means social life, which means dating, which means all that stuff. So is that all a part of your transition packet? Do you touch on all of those things or? Yes, um, you are absolutely right. It's not just one simple thing, it's a lot of different things. So yeah, we have a checklist that we have to keep us all honest on the kinds of things that we need to go through, but absolutely school. So you start and you start young with some of the, the medication stuff. You can start teaching kids about meds, making them responsible for pillboxes younger, helping them learn how to call the pharmacy, helping them learn how to call for appointments, helping, we do a lot of I do scholarships for, for some of the kids, help them write scholarships for school so that they can get into college because um, many of the kids don't have people that can help them. Um, so we do a lot of that kind of stuff that I certainly never learned in nursing school. That's for sure. Okay, well, Barb, I got a bunch of questions. Okay, so hold on. Um, first of all, uh, you, you talked about transitioning beginning really when the kids are born, when, they're, when, they, when you have those babies. But is the transitioning for you then different for the behaviorally affected yeah. they infect because they may not come to you till they're yeah. 18, or, 18 yeah. or something and you have that lifetime of experience to share with them. Yeah, that, no, you know what, I forgot to say that. You still have to do all the same things, but you just don't have as much time. Um, and um, so the relationship we develop is pretty intense um, and you build from where, from where kids are. Some kids are at a spot where they are able to negotiate things and some kids are not. So kids mm -hmm. still need to know how to take care of themselves, whether we have a year or whether we have, you know, 17 years. Um, some of those kids will transition to the adult provider and may not have all those skills, but we stay with them to continue to reinforce teaching all of those things and helping them learn to do. We may be on the phone with them quiet having them talk and then we can give them feedback on things that happened. Okay, another interesting question and um, it, it happened in my program as well. Okay. Um, how do you address children that are not aware of their diagnosis and parents don't want them to know? We've had kids come up into their mid-teen, 16, and still don't know they're perinatally infected because the parents don't want, don't want them to know or yeah. they're afraid of stigma if they, if they know. So do you have that? Do you encounter that where the parents and providers don't tell or do you have a policy where you, where you share the diagnosis with the patient early? Um, 
we go, we let the parents lead that discussion, um, and we absolutely have similar situations as you. Uh, but it's been our premise from from early on that we don't go home with families, and we have to respect where families are at. Mm -hmm. um, we strongly encourage them to disclose. Younger is always better because there's not as much baggage when they're younger um, as it is when they're older, and then it becomes normal. But even if they won't use the word HIV, we call it something, whatever they want to call it. You have to call it something. Otherwise, the kids don't understand why they have to take medicine. So there's various words that families have, have come up with that they call it, um, but we certainly, uh, one of the nurses just said she, they just disclosed to a 15 year old yesterday. Um, and mm -hmm. it's, you know, it gets harder as they get older. I agree. Sure. We do not have a policy though. Direct, a direct answer is no, we don't have a policy. And someone else wants to know, you had mentioned a transition packet. Is that something that's shareable? Um, our transition packet is our, is stuff we print, uh, we, we send, I could send a list of what we include, but we include our letters that we've written. We, we write letters to primary care providers every three months on the on where kids are at. So we send the letters and we send a summary, um, but it's nothing, it's not like a, um, it's individualized to each patient. But I could I could jot down what's in there, absolutely. Yes, that, that she said would be helpful. That would be great. Okay, yeah. Um, and there's two more questions. They pretty much are talking about the older ones um, yeah. One is saying, um, how are you able to follow someone throughout college? Like, what resources go into this process? And another one is asking about balancing the importance of meeting the young people where they are and helping them navigate a system without, with teaching them how to be successful in adult care when there's not so much support there, where there's the one-on-one -on -one support is gone. So it's, it's the, they're asking about right. the, the older kids. One, you know, what okay. the, is there something special you do with the college kids? And I don't know if you can see the questions in the chat room. I can't. I, I, I'm old. I can only do one thing at a time. So I'm talking. <laughs> 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 but I, I got your drift. So for the college, it's it's the nurses in our program. They work intensely with. We get releases for everybody we talk to, and they work with. Uh, the college, the provide, they identify a place at college where they could go have blood work, for instance, or if they need to see a provider there, we identify somebody there. We work with the, with the youth to help, they're the ones that are going to have to help us find it. And then we can have labs done right there. Um, the social worker has to get involved with some of the payment issues, if there's payment issues. Um, but we've been able to make that work. Um, and then we get the labs back here. Um, to review labs. The nurses talk with and text patients all the time. Um, there's so many, the texting has freed up uh, communication so much for, for the nurses. Uh, we were finally allowed to get iPhones last year or the year before, and that made a huge difference for texting. Um, so we're able to make it work through communication with the kid and with the local team, as well as the uh, provider here in the, in the home community so that everybody knows what's going on. And then awesome. the second question was, oh, the transition. So the nurses are very good at you wean yourself. Um, when you can wean, you start weaning yourself from what you're doing for kids and you're telling them what to do. So for example, yesterday there was, uh, there was a, a young woman who asked me to do something that I knew she was very capable of doing. And so we problem solved how she could do it. She couldn't figure out how to do it. But if, if you walk her through, she could do it then, but she just didn't know how to do it. So the nurses are really good about helping kids learn and problem solve. And then the next time something different comes up, you refer back to that and say, look at what you did last time and think about how you can use those skills this time. So there is a weaning process. Um, tied in with that. Um, some of the kids, I'll be honest, they're, they're, um, we're funded through Ryan White Part B as well, and that allows us to take care of, of people a little bit older than 24, and there have been a couple kids that we've had to hang on to because they would have dropped out of care otherwise. Okay. Um, from Sophia, she would like us all to know that there is a, a website that has a great outline of what to include in packages for transition. It's gottransition.org. So if you can see that, if you're interested, you could probably see it in the, in the website uh, URL in the uh, chat room. 
And finally, we want to know how you were able to pay for the iPhone. Was that like Ryan White money or hospital money? No. <laughs> Through our children's <laughs> hospital. <laughs> we begged and pleaded because we were spending so much time. You have to document what you text um, so that you have um, documentation of what you're doing. And it was horrible. And when you looked at how much time it was taking, the hospital did it for us. We are blessed by a manager that understands what we do. Truly, truly. Okay, um, Barb, are you okay if folks have questions later on? Can someone email you? Is that all right if they want more specific info? Yes. Okay, and Michael, do we have their email somewhere in the slides? or? Um, I can share that, or Barb, if you don't mind sharing it in the chat room, that yeah. way it's included in the notes so that um, anyone who goes to the link on the website is going to be able to um, get that later as well. I, I just wanted to uh, just add, uh, because you were talking about, um, like, how do you get uh, those iPhones and how to get uh, connected to basic technology. And also, I remember that uh, uh, the way you're connecting with uh, these kids is through text messaging. Uh, I just uh, put there, uh, I always like to put it out, that uh, link for post links uh, for retentionandcare.com is uh, the program that we are currently having. Uh, at UVA that's funded through uh, Ryan White Part B, uh, the, with the, also with the help of uh, the Virginia Department of Health. Uh, and they, uh, through that program, we provide uh, participants with phones, we pay for uh, their cell phone bill, um, and uh, that is a, a platform uh, that is uh, for smartphones to keep uh, direct contact with uh, participants as well uh, or clients. Uh, I think it's a great resource that I like to always uh, reiterate that access. Great. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you for doing that. Okay. So um, Barb will share her email. If you have more questions for Barb, um, feel free to drop her line. We're going to move on now and chat with Anna Garcia. Um, Anna is a PhD licensed a clinical social worker and an assistant professor of clinical pediatrics at the University of Miami. She's also an adjunct professor in the School um, of Social Work at Barry University. She has um, 33 years uh, working with the WIKI population, first as a clinical social worker on the inpatient pediatric unit at Jackson oh, Memorial yeah. Hospital, and then as co coordinator for the HRSA Pediatric AIDS Healthcare Demonstration Project. And I'll just note, Anna, to you that um, my project in New Jersey was also a demonstration project. So it's really cool to have you um, to have you here today. Very exciting Thank for me. You. Um, when Anna's project became Ryan White funded, as ours did, uh, she became the pediatric coordinator and has since addressed quality management, uh, development of a transition protocol for aging pediatric patients. She's published on things, disclosure issues, fathers as leaders, child welfare system and orphans, many of those complex issues that affect our HIV wiki population. So we consider her a local, state, and national expert in all these um, issues as they relate to HIV and, and wiki folks. So Anna, can you start by telling us more about what you have in place in Miami? So, you know, I love these challenges. Tell me what you do in 10 words or less. So I'm going to get <laughs> the, the cliff version, <laughs> the cliff notes version of, um, of what we do here in Miami. So, you know, despite my, my longstanding experience in the program, I think as, um, as a division itself, we've, we've seen children since 1981, so we're a really old program. And so the best way to develop program is through your own experiences. Um, take what you need, throw the rest out. And, you know, I'm going to focus more on transition, and I really appreciate that Barb um, covered so many aspects of the process because um, it can be a little complicated. There are several models out there, and the way that we started our transition model is looking at what are other chronic illnesses in children's programs um, doing regarding transitioning. And so that was kind of like a springboard on how to develop our model. And um, I wanted to describe our two youth populations. So Dr. Larry Friedman, who's Director of Adolescent Medicine here in Pediatrics, cares for the behaviorally acquired HIV youth population. 
um, through age 25. In infectious diseases where I work, um, we transition our young people um, at age 24. So happy to say, because we made so many inroads in reducing maternal child transmission, our new cases um, don't happen often. We had um, a little rash of increased newborn, infected newborns in 2015, and you know we always try to address how do we miss these opportunities to prevent transmission. But today we have 100, only 130 um, children, infants, children, and youth in our program because we've done our job. Um, we've been able to um, transfer and transition out a number of young people from infectious diseases through the year. So let me tell you how we, we started our, um, our intervention. So it's a work in progress. We always have to review, evaluate, look at what's working, tweak it, change it, ask for more money, hire different people um, to make it work. So in 2003, our first um, young person miraculously turned 24 and we said, holy cow, this kid's last appointment is now and you know what are we gonna do? So she was more a transfer than a transition because we don't know where the time went. All of a sudden she was 24 and we had to send her somewhere else. And it just turned out because Miami is such a large, small community, this 37, now 37-year-old 37 woman, I ran into her in a gas station by my house a couple of weeks ago. And, and I'm saying, oh my God, you know, well, how are you doing, whatever. She's a, a nurse's aide. She's been working at a, a rehab facility for the last nine years. She's not dating, is a little worried about um, having children, but her biological clock is ticking. And she is just in the bloom of health. And it was wonderful to see her. And so, you know, I started, we always get um, a lot of the youth coming back uh, to our program because we have a screening clinic where we evaluate uh, newborns for HIV infection. So a lot of our um, transferred, transitioned young people end up coming back with their babies to our clinic and we're always it just seems like we're always in touch with them. Either they stop by to say hi or we're taking care of um, some of their um, children. So in 2003, since 2003, 180 young people have aged out of our program over the last 14 years. So most of these were transitioned, not transferred, and unfortunately 17 of these young people died either right before transitioning or shortly thereafter because they were so ill. And so for us the dilemma is do you continue to follow them in, in their transfer to hospice services, what happens if they refuse um, hospice, and you've got to put them in another system of medical care, the, the adult system. And, you know, lots, it's very complicated um, for them to leave a program where they're so attached to so many staff to begin with someone new at the end of their life. So for us, that was a um, very difficult process for many of these young people, and I think it's the only piece that we still um, have yet to refine. So looking at our model, we have two arms of it, the transition work that we do in um, adolescent medicine and the transition work in infectious diseases. Let me kind of tell you how we started it in, in infectious disease. So we ran focus groups. I think that for any program building a transition intervention, you have to find out what do your patient population, um, what do they need? So we focus grouped with um, um, youth that did transition or were in the process of transitioning and younger youth to get their ideas of, okay, I'm, I'm still only, you know, 18, 19, what do I, where do I want to be by the age of 24, 25? And then another focus group with their caregivers. And oh my God, was that painful. Because, you know, just, just the conversation about one day you're not going to be here set up such a rebellion and so much resistance. And uniformly, both the caregivers and the, the kids were saying, you know, we can't leave, you're abandoning us. There was a lot of emotion. And so trying not to make it a, um, a therapy session, we had to stick to the focus group questions. But 
it's inevitable and how can you help us build program to make this as seamless and not painful for so we learned a lot through that process and we started with a protocol and the first thing we did is draw up a list of possible providers, um, both in the community and within our own medical center. So not all our, our patients um, wanted to stay here at UM Jackson. The Jackson hospital system um, has a lot of barriers. It's very complex. It's a huge adult clinic space, very personal. Um, and so, um, those who did not want to come here, we found great providers in the community and we had to look for those that had Ryan White funding because we know that after the age of 18, many of our young people lose their Medicaid and their insurance and they need some kind of coverage. So we're pretty limited um, with other providers that are not Ryan White um, adult docs. Um, we do have a few on our list that only take private insurance or cash, um, but mostly they're Ryan White providers. If the young person has a lot of other medical complexities, comorbid health conditions, staying here at the medical center is their only option because it's it easier for them to navigate through the system and we are also here to continue to help them. So. In adolescent medicine, we had um, supported a piece of funding for an internal medicine doctor, Alexis Powell, who um, initially went to adolescent medicine's clinic one afternoon, once a month. And so when the young person was um, approaching age 24, 25, Dr. Powell would be their physician and for one year would be providing the medical care and then once they aged out of adolescent medicine, they streamed into her clinic um, at Jackson Hospital. So we tried that model in infectious diseases and it didn't work so well for us. Um, our kids, uh, the, the perinatally acquired young people are very complex and are very, very ill. Oh, hold on one moment. Sorry about that. All right. There we go. Sounds like a good party, huh? Yeah, it does. <laughs> um, so our kids were, were very complex and very ill, and um, we needed to start sending them to other physicians within internal medicine that could handle renal disease, um, hypertension, um, to tuberculosis, and so we are lucky enough that in internal medicine there are a lot of HIV um, tree, uh, providers who have subspecialties themselves in other organ diseases. So we kind of eased Dr. Powell um, out of our clinic, but she stayed very active in Dr. Friedman's um, adolescent medicine clinic. So we learned through the focus groups, um, we learned through trial and we did set up a life skills and health promotion workshops, um, identifying some of those um, skills needed um, that, that Barb covered. Um, we hired, so, so we hired a licensed clinical social worker through a HRSA supplemental grant. And we thought that the, the young people really could use some free mental health. They didn't have to go to psychiatry. They got all of this emotional support through a licensed clinical social worker who can provide case management and mental health services. And then we realized that most of the work she was doing was case management. So she was a very expensive model. She went on maternity leave and we kind of reformatted this position and hired a bachelor's social worker case manager. And so we had her for about three years. It worked pretty well. And then we lost our funding. So we laid her off. And then the third um, iteration is we had a staff person who was our clinic assistant for 13 years. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. That jazzy out of old music. <laughs> She was very familiar with um, the population and so we promoted her to a patient navigator and this version of this position seems to be working very, very well. So the way that the patient navigator helps the transitioning youth is by, go, if they want it, 
attending the first medical visit in the adult site with the young person. Um, she prepares a package of all of the medical information from kids um, to be there at the first visit. And for one year, she kind of gently follows these young people. And by one year, you're cut off. And so what we discovered that although technically we couldn't continue to lend that kind of level of support in the transitioning process once you're 25, if the young person comes back to our office and is needing help with whatever, we're there to be there for them. So we hired um, an evaluator to see how well we were doing transitioning a few years ago. It was her doctoral project. Um, she was getting a PhD in health promotion. And she did a wonderful job evaluating um, the work that we had done so far. And so some of the outcomes were that, the, that, as we know, if they're very ill at the end of pediatric care, they're the likelihood of surviving into adult care and the transition being successful was very low, as evidenced by the 17 young people who have died. Um, they are asking, they're, they're reporting having um, missing support group and feeling kind of isolated. When they're in the pediatric clinic or the youth clinic, they make friends with some of the young people that are there, um, they're friends on Facebook. And so being out in the community and away from their pediatric family kind of left them feeling isolated. So they're asking us to please start support groups again. So we ran a support group for 20 years. In 1995, we started a, um, a support group that the kids called Cool Kids with, with a K. And it was, it was just a wonderful experience. The social workers and the peers co-facilitated. We had a group for the negative siblings called um, the Kids Connection. And it was great for that population of youth who we lived in kinship households or were in foster care. Most of them um, lost their parents. And so they found they created a whole new little family in this cool kids. But now the young people are very different today. The, their needs today, they have their parents. Um, they're on better medications. Um, socially, they're just doing so much better. And so in 2015, they just stopped coming to group. And it was a very expensive, um, endeavor, and we just stopped having group. But I'm willing to try it again. They're asking for it. I see the benefits of attending group and having group support, so we're going to give it another shot. So one of our biggest challenges, you know, I realize that it's really, really hard to be young in today's society. And, you know, without HIV, they're already facing so much adversity and so many tests, social tests. So here you are now, you've survived the virus, you're a young person, maybe you did or did not complete school. Um, but I see that there is, um, uh, that adherence is negatively impacted by their exposures to stigma, disclosure, and so much depression and sadness. So here are some mental health issues that they're facing. And you know, they're already labeled by having HIV, and now they're facing another label um, that you're depressed and you're anxious. And so having them want to receive some mental health support and interventions is, um, is a very difficult task for us. I mean, through the years, we've called it counseling or just talking, because if we say mental health treatment or psychiatric treatment, they freak out and they don't go. So, you know, they're, they're wanting to start their families. Many of the pregnancies are not planned. We do have um, sexual health and reproduction interventions in our clinic. We have a nurse practitioner um, right now from uh, adolescent medicine who provides all of the gynecological support for the young women and can speak to the young men um, for um, conception planning. But most of the pregnancies are unplanned. Um, and then the anxieties, I do not want to have an infected baby. And so I'm happy to, to say that in, at least in our program, we have never had an HIV infected infant born from a perinatally infected mother. Not that we haven't had close calls. Um, it gets very scary, OB. 
has admitted a number of our young women to the OB service for a month of direct observed treatment in order to reduce that viral load, um, hoping that we've avoided um, maternal child transmission. So um, I, I guess, you know, in, in summarizing a lot of these experiences, I just want to say if anyone wants to start working with you, if this is a new experience for you, I want to say be patient, listen to their voices, and please learn motivational interviewing, okay? Because the last thing that the young people need is to hear lecturing from some of us who may or may not be the best parent mom in the world. Um, we want to understand that many of the young people live with a lot of ad adversity. Um, we want to um, make their lives better. We want to enrich and contribute to a better quality of life. And I ask that we be kind and respectful. I think it was Devin uh, or Noel who had said this, be respectful. Um, so my Cliff Notes version is concluded. I don't know if there are <laughs> any questions. <laughs> I can't see your slide set. Oh, that's right, you can't see. So um, thank you, thank you, Anna, for all of that. Um, I'm seeing some common themes between your program and BARBS as far as yeah. the life skills and the mm -hmm. workshops and re going beyond the medical care. Um, and also the maintaining of some kind of provider as they transition, whether it's a case manager or a, a medical provider, so they don't, it's not like a cold turkey break that there's right. that help with transition. So I think those are really, really nice things. Um, we do have one question from Dolores. It says, what are the top three situations that you have observed between behavioral and prenatally infected patients? I hear you discuss stigma, mental health, depression, but issues of housing and employment, some of the issues um, you have to address. So you can't see her question, but she's asking about um, the difference there between behaviorally and perinatally infected patients. I think that the... I think that the behaviorally infected um, patient has more advantage because their health is um, not as compromised as the perinatals. Um, the perinatals have some cognitive deficits, so um, learning situations in school are challenges. Um, you know, I have some young people with IQ are as low as 45 and as high as 119, so the to go to college for, you know, the one with the 45 IQ is much more limited. So I see that education and work opportunities um, may be more readily available for the behaviorals. Um, and, you know, they, there are a lot of similarities, more similarities than differences between both groups, in my opinion. Um, the differences, as I just mentioned, and the similarities have to do with their emotional experience living with HIV, the stigma, the community. Um, I, just this morning I was discussing, uh, we had a site visit from our, our state Medicaid program, and we were talking about housing opportunities in Miami. You know, it's a beautiful city. We have gorgeous high rises that are not readily affordable to the population that we serve. It's a beautiful city, but housing is terrible in Miami. So we do have a program, Housing Opportunities for uh, People with AIDS, HAPWA, that's um, run by the city of Miami, but there's a very long waiting list for that, and there's a very long waiting list for Section 8. So for the, the young people who are transitionally homeless, um, sometimes they'll be in shelter or they're couch surfing. But we haven't had a, a very high rate of homeless perinatal youth. Um, I'm not exactly sure if Dr. Friedman's group has had a similar uh, problem with his population. But we do have a centralized um, homeless program referral center. So we call into that and there are, uh, I'm, if I'm not mistaken today, there are nine shelters in Dade County that you could be referred to. But I know that it's more difficult for uh, men to get into shelters than it is for women with, with men or women with children. One, one that I didn't mention is that the, the same woman who evaluated our pediatric transition activities is uh, we submitted a, a HRSA supplemental application that hopefully they'll, they'll fund for us. 
excuse me, where we want her to evaluate how the adult provider side perceives and is treating the transitioned pediatric population. I think that it's the only unknown in the activity that um, we're providing right now. So she is proposing to go out to the different providers to run focus groups and to speak again to the young people who are receiving these services to see over time how this experience has been for them. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. Um, does anyone else want to open up their line or have a question for Anna um, before we move on and open this up to, to general questions and discussion? Anything else we want to address uh, with Anna right now? And just a reminder that um, I've gone through and muted all lines. Um, you'll be able to see the little orange microphone uh, to the right of your name, or if you had, uh, if you dialed into the system directly, you can navigate to where it says guest, find your phone number, and click that button. Mm -hmm. So I did get one um, question um, as well. Um, but it's, I think it's more of a comment. Um, Nilda in Buffalo uh, says that, oh, I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, Nilda in, um, wow, why am I thinking Buffalo? Nilda in um, Hartford says that she helped to organize an adult provider lunch to help make um, the pediatric transition smoother as um, uh, they move forward. Nice, nice idea. Mm -hmm. And I got another private um, chat from um, a user who said, um, I'm really interested in how many children you've worked with that are diagnosed with HIV, and I'm interested in the re um, reproduction and um, um, family planning. Um, is there a treatment process? Um, and it sounds like you have a very nice program. Thank you very much for sharing today. Thank you. So um, if, if he wants to email, we can send our protocol for the sexual health and reproduction. Oh, that would be wonderful. Is that something that we could share um, in the chat transcript, Anna? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. I'll send that to you. Thank you so much. And thanks, Francis, for the great question. Uh, Michael, this is Dolores. Hi, Dolores. Good. I wasn't sure you could hear me. But I wanted to ask the two young presenters, um, there was a question that was asked earlier about how to get young people involved um, and to get them to, to, to participate more at the table or to even share their stories. And I, I know that both of you talked about being fostered um, by somebody, but I want you to expand on that because I think there is a real deficiency in not having young voices for HIV positive. And I really want to hear from you what are some of the concrete things we could do. I, I like the presenter who talked about learning how to do texting or, or, or social media, but um, I really would like to hear from you what are some of the things you think we could do right away. Uh, personally, what I think some of the things that might work are uh, some things that we've planned around, some things that we've toyed around with. Right now, we are also experimenting with texting our patients who are kind of slipping in and out of care to see if uh, they can come back in to see if that works. We're under a lot of constraints because we're a hospital facility, so it gets kind of murky. Um, on a broader perspective, I think something that might work uh, with an idea we toyed around with a little while ago was something like a speaker's bureau. So the concept behind that would be to recruit patients to encourage them to learn how to engage in public speaking. And, you know, crafting a two to three, even four um, day session in which that could happen over a period of time in which they would learn the skills to speak publicly about their journey with HIV or whatever topic they decided to do. We're just imparting them with the knowledge of how to speak publicly. Um, and if that works, then recruiting them for future events where we do outreach. So once they've graduated this you know, program where they do a speakers bureau, then we can invite them back to then speak to staff or to other events or outreach events where they can then be in the public eye. And then this will connect them with other opportunities and also give them the wherewithal and the confidence to be able to uh, move forward with those new sets of skills and perhaps even uh, become an advocate themselves in the community regarding HIV. 
Thank you. I I I wouldn't say that um you stole my words, Devin. <laughs> uh, we, I mean, I totally agree with uh, what you said. Uh, I think that is the, the best way uh, to really connect with them uh, and, and really like uh, reaching out and, and asking uh, to them like really like what the needs are and, and trying to connect with them and uh, empowering them to uh, and support them to be involved uh, to really like um, participating in uh, different events that uh, their CBO or uh, clinic might have um, available for them uh, for their professional development uh, and really invest in the public speaking. Uh, I think that that is that is I think that is crucial um, in building new leaders to in in their own communities to uh, later on really uh, be able to reach out to the, the other younger uh, the other younger ones. Thank you. Great. Oh. Go ahead, Jane. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to everybody. Um, we can um, move on. What what we have about ten minutes, Michael? Left? Yeah. And I think that we've shared a lot of resources so far, but, um, you know, I think that maybe if we can combine Q&A with resource sharing, if, you know, people's minds are jogged, or if you have additional resources you wanted to share within the chat room, I think that would be a cool way to kill two birds with one stone. Sure. And uh, this is not a time to be shy, folks, because um, um, if you have some questions, you've got four fabulous folks here on the line um, that can help. Um, and if you don't ask questions, then I'm going to. So I'd rather hear from you. Do you have any, even if it's comments or experiences regarding youth that maybe we did not touch on that you think are important and critical and you want to share, um, please uh, um, unmute your line and um, give us a talk. So she is left now, but Susan sent um, a, a question earlier for Barb. Um, I think she was really fascinated by um, the model you have for um, kind of going from your central location and meeting people in the community where they're at. And she was wondering, you know, considering that, how large the caseloads are for the nurses? Um, and so, you know, how much time do they spend on the road and how much time do they have to plan and, and, and all of that? Um, uh, that's a great question, and, and um, the caseload varies uh, depending on the patient population um, that we work with. For adult women, which we do the same thing, the caseload is capped at 25 because we just we do so much heavy mm -hmm. medication management. For the youth, it's different, and we haven't figured out how to cap that yet. The they ha the nurses have probably around 30 patients. Um, youth needs are very different and they're, and they're sporadic, um, but it would be no more than 35 patients um, that we would want them to have. When you look at the literature from linkage to care, um, the literature talks about 15 um, clients or patients. Um, I don't think we could get funded for that. I think we've been funded for between 25 and 30. Thank you. And there's, can I add one other thing? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. oh, there's one other population, I, I threw it in the chat room, I didn't know if my line was unmuted. Um, but we've, we, there's a number of kids that have been adopted um, who were diagnosed with HIV over in many different countries. Ethiopia is one, but there's a yes. lot of other kids yes. from other countries. And that's a very special group of kids. Those kids typically are not sick that are adopted um, for many reasons, I think, but the, um, and many of those kids are adopted older. Um, and there's a whole, lo a whole lot of literature about adoption mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. and you put that there with, um, with HIV, and uh, I'd be interested if there's other places that are seeing that and how they're helping kids. Part of it is some of the kids get angry at their biological parent because they gave them the virus. Some are mad that they're adopted. Some do very well, but there's just a whole different gamut of things to, to learn about with those groups. Yes. Uh, hi, this is Nilda from Connecticut. How are you? Uh, we're seeing that same trend here. Um, our newest 
trend of, of HIV perinatally infected kids are kids that are being adopted from different countries. We have about 10, 10 kids in the past couple of years that have been adopted. Um, they're younger though, they tend to be six under 10 years old, most of them. I think one came in as a 12 year old from, from Jamaica. Um, but we haven't seen the behaviors just yet. I think we, we're working with the families in adjusting to having a kid that's HIV positive blending in with their their biological kids, which is what we're seeing here in, in the Connecticut area, or in Hartford anyway. Oh, with the, our, our new adoptees. Yeah, we're getting kids from all over the world. Cool, being adopted, thank you. Which is really cool. It is, a, yeah, it's, it's like a different group. So we were adjusting as, as the families are adjusting, we're adjusting to <laughs> to learning how they're functioning as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I see Ellen comments that there are some, a, a, a lot of Russian children in that same situation. Ellen, are, is there anything special that New Jersey providers are doing for these, for this group or? If you're still there and can unmute yourself. Okay. If there not, she is. I, mean, I unmuted. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, no, not really special, but um, we do for some reason. And if I talk to Jane, um, Cooper seems to have them. Sue seems to get them. Our Southern Clinic. Um, huh? You know, she has like four or five in her one clinic that have been like that, and. Roseanne in our New Brunswick clinic has a couple also. And so far we haven't had any special issues. But, um, you know, in New Jersey, we've had a lot of children that have been adopted, you know, from New Jersey overall due to the fact a lot of our perinatals have had lost their parents mm -hmm. or, you know, the grandparent who was raising them. So they've been adopted out. Um, I agree with the, I forget who said it, they have, a, um, I think Anna said it, and you're correct, we have a lot of children with cognitive issues here in New Jersey that were perinatal, so that's always a big difference between our behavioral and our peris at our youth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a question for, for Anna, for the, for the kids who transition into adult care and do not make that first appointment, what happens with them? So the, the patient navigator follows up on that and um, assesses, you know, if there were any barriers, did you forget, do you not have transportation, and then um, does like a conference call and helps them make a second appointment and offers to go with them again. I mean, she's gone out a number of times and has been at the appointment and the patient hasn't shown up. So it's a little frustrating on her end, but you know she keeps trying, and the kids really appreciate it, and it, and it works. So since having her, we have found that more kids make their first appointment in the adult setting than in the past. Great. Uh, we we developed a, a youth transition tool actually in protocol a few years back with um, some partners and Annette um, Magnani uh, with the National Quality Center consultant. And what we did um, is similar to what you're, you, you presented. We, we, we look at the readiness, the user readiness, competencies, looking at knowledge, age, and the provider's readiness as well because we do struggle with that. And once we're all ready, <laughs> we identify an adult provider and um, oriented the young person as to the, um, the clinic, the site, and help them if they need to learn how to take a bus, where to go to, and do all of that. And then the case manager is the person that walks the young person through the process. And also, like you mentioned, goes, schedules their first appointment and goes with them to their first appointment. If our protocol is if the kid makes the second, the youth, excuse me, <laughs> makes the yes, second yes. appointment, um, it's considered a, a successful transition. But if they do not make that second appointment, we automatically book a safety appointment with our pediatrician so that we keep up with our ID doc here so they don't fall through the cracks. And, and we've had to use that safety appointment on, on a few occasions uh, because the young person just wasn't quite as, as ready as we thought that he or she was, and we've had to bring them back. And I'm saying a 24-year-old, a 25-year-old, 26-year-old, bring them back to PD so that we don't lose them into care. Just to keep One them of the things engaged, and then we try, that, try the process all over again. Yeah, one of the things that we realized is that um, there, it's not always a perfect match or a perfect mm -hmm. fit. Um, mm -hmm. Patients mm -hmm. with 
spider and that they're mm -hmm. welcome. So don't don't just drop out because you don't like them. Right. Let us know right. that you don't them and we'll go through the list again and we'll try someone else. Um, right. And so we found that that was a, a helpful um, strategy. And the problem is that if you've got a limited list of providers, sometimes you got to keep working with the patient to find out what's the mismatch, the, the discontent. Because, right. you know, if, if you've got other organ involvement, other comorbid conditions, this is a provider who's going to take care of you the best. How can we help you work with him better, you know? Yeah, we had have, we have a couple of clients whose parents had, had passed and they decided when they were ready, they thought they were ready, to go to their parents' ID adult provider. But when it came to reality, they weren't quite as ready. So that's where we lost a couple of them, or we almost lost them to the second mm -hmm. appointment because it was too traumatic for them, which is, which is definitely different. You know, I'm so sorry to have to say this, but I know that most of our kids are going to make it and many won't. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. is so, in so many aspects mm -hmm. of you know, adolescent and youth life, you're going to succeed at many things and some things, you know, right. are not going to resonate. Right. Right. And, and for us, some of the young people, what we've been doing um, is besides getting them engaged in a youth advisory board here to help us improve our process, we've also um, helped them get engaged and involved in our local uh, planning councils and our prevention councils and those types of um, train, uh, areas, but providing them training as well as hand-holding uh, so then guiding them through this process. So a lot of, we have a lot of our young folks sitting at different tables um, to help them, to teach them how to advocate for better services for themselves and their peers as well. It's been a process, maybe <laughs> 10 years long, but I think finally we're starting to see some, some breakthrough with the young adults. And, and the providers as well, and the people in the community are also embracing the young people, which was, you know, mm -hmm. it's just different. Mm-hmm. And nice to see happen. Great. Well, I see that the time is now 2.30, so uh, we're going to have to wrap up. And I know that there are a number of um, questions that we um, didn't have a chance to get to uh, that came in um, in the chat room. Um, so hopefully we're able to kind of keep this discussion going. Um, um, I'm going to include um, the chat transcript, the recording, and the link to the, uh, to the evaluation in an email that will come later this afternoon. And hopefully we'll be able to pick up the discussion with each other um, in that email announcement that comes out. Um, just to kind of give you a sense of what's coming around the corner, we only have two months left of this initiative. Um, in May, we're going to focus on sustaining the gains that we've made so far, and in June, we're going to be talking about um, spread. <clears throat> Part of what we're doing in May to um, see what we're, we've already done is that we're going to have an action week, um, and uh, we're going to have a number of ways that people can participate, um, and guidance and um, suggestions and tips around each of them. It can be sharing data, an improvement project that you did, information on a training you did, or a town hall forum, a community discussion, and um, you know other items such as that. Um, for every submission that you make, uh, you will be entered for a prize drawing um, for a little um, basket of goodies from NQC and um, as a thank you for your participation and for sharing um, some of those important uh, outcomes. Um, we also have um, Partners in Care webinars that uh, look at the same issues, and our next Partners in Care webinar is next Thursday to explore youth, but from the, um, from the consumer perspective. Uh, we have two office hours coming up. Um, tomorrow we have one that's looking specifically at differences in behavior in perinatal infected youth and if there are any differences in interventions. Um, we heard that there are, um, as far as caring for people and, you know, matters of the heart and the human side of things, um, there are a lot of similarities. But as far as some of the um, cognitive differences and some of the other um, timing and life challenge issues, um, there are some differences. So that's going to be an exciting conversation tomorrow and you're all invited to participate. On May 5th, we have a journal club with Dr. Teddy Sparoff, and he's going to be discussing um, um, PDSA cycles and um, common reasons why um, people get stuck, and hint, hint, it all focuses on strategic planning. So we have one of our recipient friends from Washington, D.C., uh, Metro Health, um, on the line with us to help us um, look at an example so that we can apply the learning from Dr. Um, Sparoff's talk to something that's really happening in the Ryan White field today. 
And that is it for today's webinar. Um, I'm Michael Hager with the National Quality Center, and I want to, uh, you know, enthusiastically and, and warmly and, um, you know, thank all of our presenters. Thank you, Devin. Thank you, Noel. Thank you, Barb. Thank you, Anna. And thank you so much, Jane, for facilitating today's call. And, of course, thanks to everyone who joined us um, and participated in the discussion. I'm really excited to keep this conversation going. I'm Michael Hager with the National Quality Center. Thanks, and um, see you again really soon. Bye. Bye, thanks, Michael. Michael. Thank you so Bye, much. Thank you. Bye-bye.